Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all had a good lunch. My name is Ken Van Mersbergen, and my topic of discussion today is a magic triumph to tragedy. You know, Magic was the second third-party software company ever, and it's an interesting story. So, I'm also known as Dutchman2000 on AtariAge.com, and I'm quite active in the forums there if you want to find out all the things I'm up to. So, and here we go. Uh, we're going to start off um, with a memoriam. Uh, this past May, we lost Bob Smith, as many of you know. Uh, he was he worked for Atari and in Magic later, uh, wrote a lot of the games for for Magic, as you'll find out during this presentation. Um, described by Seamus Blackley as the most extraordinary man with the most ordinary name. <laughs> Bob loved talking about the old days, and I love listening to his stories. We will miss you, Bob. And let's talk about the beginning there. At that time, there was Atari, and not long after, there was Activision. And it was known that Atari was making a lot of money off the cartridges, but not sharing that money, nor giving any royalties to the programmers. And or, or credit yeah, either. And one company was created out of that, Activision. And pretty soon, there was another one. A magic. Created by experts for experts, was their tagline. They were founded on July 17th, 1981, although their initial filing date was June 1st. But they didn't start operating as a company until July 17th. And by Bill Grubb, Dennis Koble, Jim Goldberger, and Brian Daugherty in the main four, and joined quickly thereafter by Bob Smith, Rob Fulop, Dave Duran, Gary Cato, and Mark Bradley. Those are the original nine Imagic employees. This is the cover to their first press kit. As you can see, they were advertising as making games for both the Atari VCS and the Mattel and Television Master Component, the first company to do so. At that time, Activision only made stuff for the Atari VCS. They did not get to the Intellivision yet. But Imagic came out the door we're going to make for both. So let's get started with 1982. Although they formed in 81, they needed some time to get the development stations running, get the games going before they could release any product. That didn't happen until 1982. Let's see the products they released for the Atari VCS. Trick Shot, full simulation game designed by Dennis Koble, formerly at Atari. Yeah, maybe a little video on this one. Imagic makes some of the toughest games for Atari's video system. Because they're created by experts. Meet the inventor of Star Voyager, Gorp. Oh, uh, how'd you do? Uh-oh. Gorp made Star Voyager just like his journey to Earth. Hi, Mommy. There were enemy ships, meteors. That looks tough. He even had to go through Stargates to get here. Ha! You missed it! Oh. <laughs> oh. See if you're good enough for Star Voyager from Imagic. You have to admit, their advertising was pretty good back then. Probably better than some of Atari's ones. Star Voyager. Basically, their version of Star Raiders, pretty much. Done by Bob Smith. Bob would admit later, though, Activision did a better job with their Star Master than he did with his Star Voyager. They just did it better. Which of you Imagic experts has created the toughest game for Atari's video system? Demon attack! Who oh. will there, Fire Breath? You not good enough for demon attack! You win this for the moon! I winning! Good work, Voltar. Demon attack really is tough. Imagic demon attack. In television version, coming soon. No doubt about it, Demon Attack was basically the cash cow for a magic. It was their hot title, their number one selling title. Space Shoot 'em Up. Signed by Rob Fulop, formerly of Atari, his first product for a magic. Demon Attack sold really well. It's the game they're still known for now. And they created it for a lot of different platforms later on. created Atlantis for a magic. I was at Atlantis. The skies above the underwater city filled with Gorgon attack vessels. Three century posts fought desperately, but they were no match for the Gorgon death rays. But you're here. I thought the Gorgons destroyed everybody at Atlantis. Ah! We did! Ah! Atlantis by a magic is for Atari <laughs> and in television systems. 
Still pretty good advertising, huh? <laughs> Atlantis. That was the other successful game by uh, Magic. That sold a lot, of, a lot of copies as well. But the two different box designs. I think the second one came out later because it doesn't have the new designation, a nighttime scene and a daytime scene. Uh, no reason was given for the running change. And that's what it looked like. Multicolored characters, pretty decent graphics. They were pretty good because uh, Magic had a graphic artist. And Dennis Coble, his second game. This game also had a contest associated with it, Defend Atlantis and Win its Lost Treasure of Gold. The contest did happen because uh, Dennis remembers going to the Bahamas and meeting some of the contestants, but um, no one knows what the results were or who the winner was. Uh, they did make a special version for the contest. It was dubbed as, and known as Atlantis 2. Basically, it was a tougher version of Atlantis and used a different scoring font because the high score would be the ultimate winner. They want someone to cheat by using the older, easier game. Firefighter. Signed by Brad Stewart, another former Atari and that went to a magic. Riddle of the Sphinx. Bob Smith, the second game for a magic. Another good game there. This one also had a kind of a contest with it. Can you solve the Riddle of the Sphinx? Basically, you had to be creative and accurate to win. And I remember Bob saying that uh, people sent in papyrus scrolls and all sorts of interesting things he received as part of this contest. It was really weird. And then the media started to notice. Magic is the best put together new company in the field. They have everything going for them. That was Arnie Katz, an issue of Electronic Games. <laughs> this is probably my favorite one. This new Magic game is mine now. Mine! And that goody goody prince who created it will never get it back. <laughs> I'll name it Dragonfire! <laughs> See that puny friend stick across the bridge past my dragon fire? <laughs> I'll never let the treasure be taken by that goody goody namby pamby. Hey! Underhanded, sneaky little. The Magic's Dragon Fire is for Atari 2600 and in television. Now, dragon fire is probably my favorite Magic game, and it's a very difficult game as well. Designed, of course, by Bob Smith. Another winner. The game started at known as Cheese. It was actually a cat and mouse where the cat was trying to get the mouse before the mouse could get the cheese. Eventually, it morphed into Dragonfire. Sure to how much change these games go through. TV. Check. Cosmic Arc cartridge. Check. Power. Yeah, power. Cosmic Arc is a game cartridge for the Atari video system. Meteor! I got it! The Cosmic Arc searches out strange creatures on distant planets. But the deeper the arc travels in space, the tougher it gets. Give me nothing, get back to Earth! Boy, clean your room. We're back. Cosmic Arc by Imagic. The video system must be bought separately and connected to the TV by your parents. <laughs> Sometimes they had to be explicit. <laughs> yeah, Cosmic Arc. By Rob Fulop. The Atlantis and Cosmic Arc games are kind of related. They both use the same small spaceship end of Atlantis. When you lose the game, the spaceship takes off, and it's the same spaceship you're controlling in Cosmic Arc. That was an inside joke that they did to link the games together. They were in development at the same time. But near the end of 82, Magic created, released their first products for the Intellivision system. It took a little longer because they needed to get, once again, set up their development stations and get that going before they could create actual Intellivision products, which is a little bit tougher than making the Atari ones. But... They also started off with an advertising campaign. The magic experts have just created four new games for the Intellivision system. But beware, the magic's demon attack will destroy you. Atlantis will send you to a watery grave. Microsurgeon will put you in the hospital. And Beauty and the Beast will push you right over the edge. Imagine for Intellivision, created by experts for experts. Demon Attack, again, their number one seller, now converted to the Intellivision. Run by Gary Cato, one of the founders. And Atlantis, their second biggest title, also ported to the Intellivision. This one done by Pat Ransell. In my opinion, this is the best version of Atlantis that came out during that time. Because the graphics are enhanced, uh, the saucer, the middle gun is actually a saucer you can take off and do battle in the sky with the Gorgons, but also it had something else. Night mode. 
Pretty cool programming trick, but very effective. And it's the only version that had that. Microsurgeon. Is that my Rick Levine? Beauty and the Beast. Which to me is uh, Magic's uh, Donkey Kong Crazy Climber hybrid knockoff. It's pretty obvious where the influence came from. That was done by Wendell Brown. And Dragonfire. By Alan Smith. It'll take a bit of time. If you notice the, the Magic packaging, they did a really good job in their packaging to get people to notice the product on the shelf with the shiny silver boxes. And the cartridges had the shiny silver labels on them. It was more expensive to print the boxes like this, but they believed that investment would pay off in sales, and initially it did. I mean, they were really noticeable on the shelves next to the other products. Whitewater, an Intellivision exclusive by Douglas Fultz. Swords and Serpents. Designed by Brian Daugherty. The only game that he would design at, in, at uh, Magic, even though he's one of the founders. Dracula, an interesting game. Television exclusive, designed by Alan Smith. Tropical Trouble, the sequel to Beauty and the Beast. Designed by Steve DeFrisco. And this time, a magic shipped their millionth cart. Unbelievable, right? They were doing really well. I believe the cartridge was a Star Voyager game he's holding there. That's the, that's the, that's the millionth cart that they shipped. Here's what uh, was said about that. We have worked very hard. We have some very smart people. There has to be somebody upstairs looking down who has given us some lucky breaks, and everybody in this company is aware of it. That was Bill Grubb, CEO of Magic. And this time they did put up a product for the Atari computers. What else? Of course, Demon Attack. This was designed by Dave Johnson. This was just a... Simple port over of the 2600 version with no enhancements whatsoever. Um, when Dave talked about that, he said that's what he was told to do. He was told to make to port the 2600 game over to the computer. That's what he did, and that's it. He didn't know any better. And in December of 82, Magic had a stock offering. That's the name of December. Magic will come to Wall Street, the first public company born out of the video game explosion. Formed in 1981 by executives and game designers who defected from the two industry leaders, Mattel and Warner Communications Atari, Magic has recorded one of the brightest starts of any new company in the short but volatile history of Silicon Valley. Sales of Magic's first fiscal year, which ends in March, could exceed $75 million. Two of its video games, Demon Attack and Atlantis, are rated 8th and 12th respectively on Billboard Magazine's latest ranking of best-selling cartridges. The company, with headquarters 10 miles south of San Jose in Los Gatos, already is highly profitable. A few of the 15 competitors in the business already have faltered badly, but a Magic's financial backers and some industry watchers argue that good management and talented designers have given it an edge over most of the throng. And they were going to offer the stock IPO, I believe, is at $14, $15 a share to the public. And they were banking on selling a lot of stock and getting a lot of needed funds to continue doing what they were doing. However, there are a couple of things that got in the way. First, they were sued. Who sued them, do you ask? Well, Atari. Why did Atari sue them? Well, Atari Inc. said yesterday that it had filed a copyright infringement suit against the Magic Corporation, a maker of home video game software. Atari, which is a subsidiary of Warner Communications, contends that a Magic's game Demon Attack is a copy of Centuri Inc.'s arcade game Phoenix which Atari has exclusive rights to produce for the home game market. And Magic is a fast-growing maker of video games that can be played on the Atari, Mattel, and television systems. Its first public stock offering, scheduled for December, is eagerly awaited, analysis say. Demon Attack, a game in which wing-flapping aliens invade and land, is the best-selling game made by a Magic and one of the ten best-selling home video games in the nation, according to Billboard magazine. Bruce Davis, vice president for legal affairs at Magic, said the suit would not have a big effect on the stock offering, although the company would include an amendment in his prospectus dealing with the matter. He said he could not comment on the merits of Atari's claim because he had not yet seen the suit or the Phoenix game, but he questioned why Atari's suit was not filed sooner since Demon Attack had been on the market for nine months. Well, I think I might be able to answer Bruce's question, you know, we're a little way too late. I mean, let's look at the game here. That's Demon Attack. That's Phoenix. It looks similar? A little bit. 
I mean, there's more enemies in Phoenix than, than there are in Demon Attack, but they're both space shooters, you know? But I think it wasn't the 2600 version that Atari was concerned about. Because in Phoenix, there's a spaceship level. This was not present in the 2600 version of Demon Attack, but the Intellivision version had a spaceship in it, and I think that's what got Atari's goat. With that, the game is the same, and they sued him. However, um, the results of that lawsuit was settled out of court, but no one knows what the settlement was. We have no idea it was a closed suit, and I can't find any records of it, probably because of for that reason. But I believe they came to some sort of solution regarding it. Perhaps a royalty sharing or who knows. But the other thing that happened at that time, on December 7th, Atari reported only a 10 to 15% increase in expected earnings, not the 50% figure so many people have been counting on. So then the following day, Warner stock had plummeted to two-thirds of its previous value, and Warner closed out the quarter with its profits down to mind-boggling 56%. And there was panic on Wall Street. Video game stocks were poison. So at first, the Magic delayed their IPO, their stock offering, but later withdrew it completely because we wouldn't have done anything after Warner announced those numbers. So Magic had to plot on without that financial backing. Which brings us to 1983. And Magic changed its publishing course. Well, they said they're still going to make games for the 2600 in television and the new ColecoVision, but also branch out into the realm of personal computers as that's where they said the future is going, and it's a very exciting time, as Bill said. Shoot Gallery. Well, this does have a copyright date of 1982. This did come out in 1983 uh, by Dennis Coble. It's basically their version of Carnival. Quick Step. A cubert type game. Done by Dave Johnson. Notice their packaging a little different now. A little bit of red banner, still with the shiny silver, but a little different now. Moonsweeper, an space shooter designed by, you guessed it, Bob Smith. Another good one. Laser Gates, designed by Dan Oliver. Now, Dan did not work for a Magic, he worked for Atari. But he sold the game to a Magic, so he got the credit. Subterranea. Oh, it's kind of an interesting, weird shooter type game. Designed by Mark Klein. Fathom. That's designed by Rob Fulop. No Escape. I think this was originally known as Escape from Argus. That's designed by Michael Green. Solar Storm. This is based on the arcade game Avalanche, believe it or not, by Dennis Coble, and he programmed it. This was Dennis' last game for Magic as he would leave shortly thereafter and move on to new things. Another one of the founders. Wing War. Uh, I know this box looks very different from the others we've seen so far, right? Because this was only released in Europe. This was not released in the, in the U.S., which is odd to me because I figured this is where the market was at the time, but apparently there was a thriving market in Europe. Um, Michael Green, who programmed it, was told this game would not be released at all. So he was kind of shocked when he found out it was released in Europe only. And in television releases, Fathom comes to the Intellivision by Dave Duran. Safecracker, Be a Master Spy, a television exclusive, signed by Marvin Bendick. Truckin', Truck Simulator 1.0, back in 1983, designed by Rick Levine. Nova Blast, pretty, pretty good shooter on the Intellivision there, designed by Wendell Brown. Ice Trek, another Intellivision exclusive, signed by Patrick Smits. And for the Atari 400, 800, and 1200 XL, Atlantis finally came to that computer. Again, a straight port of the 2600 game by Dave Johnson. Again, he was told to a straight port. Didn't do anything graphically really enhanced. It's a little bit graphically enhanced in the 2600, but the gameplay is identical. Because again, that's what he was told to do. That's what he did. Didn't even think of, of enhancing it. And also, they released games for the Odyssey 2. The only company in the United States to release products for the Odyssey 2. And what were they? Of course, Demon Attack, their best-selling game. It actually plays pretty good on the Odyssey, too. If you haven't tried it, give it a try. It actually plays pretty well on the system. And, of course, Dave Johnson did that port. And Atlantis, their other bestseller. Also plays pretty well, but you only have the side shooters and no center shot. So it's a tougher game overall. 
and Jeff Ronnie did that conversion. And they'd also released their first products for the ColecoVision. Starting with Nova Blast, Wendell Brown's Intellivision shooter, converted to the ColecoVision by Clinton Ballard. Moonsweeper, Bob Smith's Atari shooter, converted by Wendell Brown. Fathom comes to ColecoVision. By Mark Vursanger. Wing War. That's a bit, and this one's a bit of a rare one. I think it's the only uh, one of the few U.S. releases of Ring War came out for the ColecoVision. And it was designed by Alan Smith. And they also released games first for the Big 20. And what was the first one? You guessed it. Demon Attack. This one plays really well and looks really good on the Big 20. That was conversed by Bruce Peterson. And Dragonfire. This looks also really good on the Big 20. And it's and then they're not using fat graphics. They look really good. Atlantis. Looks amazing on the Big 20. And Bruce Peterson programmed that. And of course, they brought products to the TI-994A. Nine nine Although a week after they announced they'd be making products of the TI-994A, nine nine TI announced they're leaving the industry. Pretty bad luck for a magic right there again. You know? But they did release products for them. Microsurgeon with speech and graphically enhanced by Rick Levine. Uh, Rick said he had really enjoyed programming on the TI because it gave him a lot more room to operate and higher resolution graphics and speech. Although I, I didn't point out to him there was also speech on the Intellivision because you know, I, I, I just didn't want to go there. <laughs> Super Demon Attack. This was designed by the Western Games Design Group. It was outsourced. Magic outsourced this game to the Western Games Design Group. Um, but uh, it's known as Demon Attack. Uh, Super Demon Attack, they said, was probably added by marketing after the fact. Fathom with speech. And it looks exactly like the ColecoVision version because they share the same graphics hardware. So they use the same assets. That was designed by Neil McKenzie. Moonsweeper. Also outsourced to Western Games Design Group. Wing War. I'm by Rick Levine. Actually, this is not actually true. This game was not released, but it is my favorite game on the TI. It has speech. It is finished. It's done really good. Rick did a good job on this one. Uh, the, it, yeah. <laughs> Usually I don't get talk about unreleased games. But let's talk about Imagine's graphic artists. I think they had some really good graphic artists working for them because a lot of these games looked amazing, especially on the VIC-20 for that system. It just looked amazing. And the first one was Michael Becker. He was there from the beginning. He did all of the box art. And the box art are not uh, paintings or graphics. They are actual objects photographed. That's what he did with models. Even the dragon for Wing War. Dragon, dragon, and Wing War, they're different dragons. <laughs> but yeah, they're actually photographs with lighting and enhancements. Karen Elliott. Matt Sarconi. And Willie Aguilar. In September of 1983, an article appeared in the New York Times. Magic, a once fast-growing maker of video game software, has laid off 40 of its 170 employees instead of expected more layoffs next week. The company, which is privately held, is being hurt by the shakeout in the video game and home computer business. Margaret Davis, a company spokesman, said that Magic is reaching agreements to sell off its excess inventory to raise cash, but said the company is not filing for bankruptcy protection. That was on September 17th. And our industry is in chaos. That was Bill Grubb and his statement about the state of the industry at that time. And at that time, it pretty much was in chaos. You had all these software companies out there all competing for the same shelf space in the shelves, which was limiting. Stores were getting leaner at that time. They weren't adding on. And they said they'd have to move Atari product to put their product up. And a lot of those places were not willing to take that risk. So that really hurt a magic there as well. Which brings us to 1984. Dragonfire comes to the ColecoVision. Designed by Dave Ross. Tournament Tennis also came to the ColecoVision and Adam. Designed by DNL Research. DNL Research was another third party development company that they outsourced the game to. And notice the Bach design difference there, labeled as computer software. That's kind of the new image they're trying to put in the, in the products they put in the computer stores. A Magic 1, 2, 3. 
This was three games in one, consisting of Laser Gates, designed by Tom McWilliams, Wing War, designed by Steve DeFrisco, and Quick Step, designed by Dave Johnson. All three games for the Atari computers. These initially were going to be ROM cart releases as normal, but at the time, and with the money running out, they put them all on a, on a disc, which is cheaper, and released it as a Magic 1, 2, 3. But it is a rare compilation. I have never seen a physical copy myself. So I don't know how wide released it was. Chopper Hunt for the Atari. Designed by Tom Hudson. This was originally released in 1982 as Buried Bucks by Analog Software, uh, which is the publishing label of Analog Computing Magazine. They enhanced it a little bit and released it as Chopper Hunt. So it's a recycled game. This is an example of a magic advertising in the computer magazines at that time. Buy it on the best authority. They're trying to get their name out there in the computer business as a good as a quality maker of games. Um, every game on there was released except the baseball game called Grand Slam Baseball. I haven't been able to find out much about that, so I don't know how much work was done on that at all. But it is featured in this advertisement. And in 84, finally, the Commodore 64 would get some magic games. I started with Dragonfire. That was outsourced to PSI, another consulting company that did uh, software development. Moonsweeper. This was designed by Bob Smith and Wendell Brown, converting Wendell's shooter to the Commodore 64. Nova Blast. Wendell Brown converted his own game to, to the Commodore 64. Crime and Punishment. That was designed by Rick Oliver. Crime and Punishment is, is unique because it has a particular copy protection feature. As all of you know, back then when you copied software, which you're not supposed to do, but a lot of us tried. And usually when you copy a, a game like this, uh, when, the, when you boot the, try to boot the copy up, it just doesn't work. Either it works or it doesn't. Well, what Crime and Punishment did was the game would work, and you would think it would work, so you'd take it home, try to play it. Well, when you do that, only one case is available for you to adjudicate, because it's a judge simulator, and the crime is software piracy. <laughs> and the only punishment is death. <laughs> you gotta give Rick credit on that one. That was a pretty ingenious one to do. Internal Engine, in Injured Engine, I'm sorry, uh, designed by Dave Johnson on the Commodore 64. This was a uh, car engine repair simulator at the time. Pretty innovative for the time. I think it was the first one. I don't think I've heard of it before. And Chopper Hunt comes of the Commodore 64. Uh, we're not sure who made the conversion to the Commodore. As usually on the back of the packaging, the programmers are listed. On uh, Chopper Hunt, it only lists Tom Hudson as the Atari developer. It does not list a Commodore developer. So it's, who knows who developed that one, but they released that one on a double-sided disc. A lot of them were double-sided. Uh, Commodore on one side, Apple II on the other. Touchdown Football. That's designed by Mark Klein. This game was so good that later um, Electronic Arts started distributing it, as you see there. And in the later 80s, around 87, 88, they re-released it entirely in new packaging and called it a Magic Touchdown Football. Tournament Tennis comes to 64. Looking better than the Caligo version, I think. Designed by the same company, DNL Research. And the Apple II got some love from a Magic or for some products. Of course, Dragonfire, which is on the flip side of the Commodore 64 disc. Designed by High Tech, another third party company. Crime and Punishment for the Apple II, designed by Rick Oliver. I believe this had the same protection scheme on it. I haven't tested this one, but the Commodore one is there. <laughs> Injured Engine. Tom McWilliams converted it for the Apple II. And the Amium PC Jr. gets products from a Magic. Starting off with Microsurgeon. Probably the best looking version of Microsurgeon was on the PC Jr. And from what I've heard, it's one of the rarest cards to find now. So it'd be pr pricey if you find it. Designed by Alan Smith for the PC Jr. And of course, Demon Attack. Designed by Bruce Peterson. Touchdown Football. By Mark Klein converted to the PC Junior. Crime and Punishment on the PC Junior. Also designed by Rick Oliver. He did all three versions. 
And believe it or not, the color computer got products from a magic. Of course, which one was it? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Demon Attack, right. It's the best-selling game. You got to put it on everything. Skyrim. <laughs> I look early for that. The third screen there is an alternate color mode you can choose if you want. If you didn't like the original one in the game. I left an alternate mode in there. And Dragonfire. What I like about Color Computer Dragonfire, notice that the room is round, like a castle turret would be. Because in the first screen, in all the games, he's entering a round room, right? But it's always square in the other versions. The color computer, it's round. And there's one system, though, a Magic did not develop for a video game system, was the Atari 5200. People ask, why was that? Well, at the time, Bill Grubb was, well, the 5200 has to prove itself before we'll start developing for it. And during Magic's time, they didn't believe that it proved itself. But they did develop one game for the 5200 that saw release. At that time, Magic was also um, taking on contract work to generate capital. They signed a contract with Parker Brothers to bring out a Star Wars the arcade game for multiple systems, and the 5200 was one of them. As to who converted the game to the 5200, we don't really know. It would have been difficult to convert it, though, from the Atari computer, so whoever it probably might have been an intern or, or someone like that. But uh, as far as we can tell, we, can't, we don't know who converted this game to the 5200. But a Magic programmed it. And there's the computer version. Now, that one was designed by Brad Stewart, but he did not indicate that he did the 5200 version. And for the 2600 also, designed by Bob Smith. Pretty good version of it, actually, for the 2600. And the ColecoVision got a version, designed by Wendell Brown. That's the Commodore 64 version by Michael Green. Which brings us to 1985. Near the end of 1984, Bill Grubb left Magic as CEO and Bruce Davis replaced him. Which brings us into currently of 1985. Once again, um, Magic was doing contract work. They sent a contract with Bantam Software to develop products based on some of their holdings, some of the books that they publish. I went with Sherlock Holmes in another bow. For the Commodore 64, designed by Bruce Peterson. And for the Apple II, designed by Brad Stewart. And the IBM PC and PC Junior version, designed by Adam Allen Smith. And this is the only version that actually has the Bantam and Imagic on the title and on the box. The other one is just a Bantam software. But Imagic did develop all the versions. They also did uh, own versions of Fusion Horn Adventure, The Cave of Time, for the Commodore 64. That was designed by Chip Curry. And the Apple II version, designed by Alan Smith. Escape, another book in the Choose Your Own Adventure series. Commodore 64 version, designed by Bob Smith. And it's a company Apple II version, also designed by Bob Smith. An interesting one. I, Damiano, the Wizard of Partistrada, based on the book. For the Apple II, Designed by Steve Frisco, and the IBM PC PC Junior version, designed by Mark Klein. Bring us to Talking Teacher. This was the final product that Magic created before the doors were closed, and that was programmed by Michael Green, who once again wasn't sure that was going to get released. He basically finished it as they were closing the doors behind him, so to speak. So basically, what happened to Magic? Well. Um, the video game crash did a number on them. As you saw, their public stock offering, they couldn't offer it. Had they been able to do so, I think they would have survived longer. But uh, a lot of it was uh, mismanagement and, of course, not going into markets when they should have. But basically what happened to Magic at that time, they did uh, file for bankruptcy protection. They had a liquidation sale. A lot of the former employees came and bought most of the stuff. But it wasn't enough money to pay all the debt that a Magic had racked up. So basically, they fell into suspension. And actually, they've been there ever since. Magic is still a company in the state of California. They're just in a suspended status. This is what I got from the Secretary of State. You see, they're suspended, they're suspended FTB. They're good in everything else, 
And the final date of operation is 4186, probably just to do paperwork filing in that. But when you're suspended, your company really can't do anything. Basically, a business entity is typically suspended or forfeited by the Franchise Tax Board, that's what FTB stands for, for failure to meet its tax requirements, such as file a state tax return, pay taxes, penalties, fees, and interest. If your client's business entity is suspended or forfeited, the Secretary of State cannot accept termination documents until the following requirements are satisfied. They have to pay all outstanding balances due, file any delinquent tax returns, and file an application for a certificate of reviver in order to bring the company back. And since that did not happen, a magic did not terminate. They're just kind of in limbo since 1986. Now, if your business is suspended, these are the things you cannot do. You cannot legally do business. You can't sell, transfer, or exchange real property. You can't file an automatic extension. Can't be issued a refund either. Start or continue a protest, meaning you can't legally do anything. I can legally close or dissolve your business. Bring an action or defend your business in court. File or maintain an appeal before the Office of Tax Appeals. And also, you cannot maintain the right to use your business name. So basically, a magic is in limbo and pretty much defenseless because they can't protect their properties. They can't sue anybody. They can't operate. They really can't do anything until these debts are satisfied. They can't even terminate. They can't even go away. So they're still in limbo. And what happened after that? You say, well, in 1987-88, Activision published this. Solid Gold Software for the Commodore 64 and Atari 800, Pitfall, and Demon Attack. Now, Demon Attack wasn't one of Activision's games. That was in a Magic game. And the Commodore 64 version was not released back in the day for the Commodore. And as I told you, a Magic is in limbo. Now, Activision did not purchase the rights to a Magic. There's been no court filing of it. There's no business record I've been able to find. So I'm wondering if they just knew that the products were not protected legally and they decided to stick this out there to see if anything would happen. Nothing did. So some years later, they did it again. Hey, you remember this? Action Mac 2 for Dawson Windows? They stuck Atlantis on there. I think they did it again. They put one product out there to see if anything would happen and nothing did, because as we know, a magic is suspended. They cannot do anything. Legally, they can't protect their stuff. They're defenseless. And then they did it again on the PSP compilation. Atlantis, Demon Attack, and Moonsweeper found its way on there. And then when they released Anthology, all of the Imagine 2600 games were on there. I mean, that's just, to me, that's just taking advantage of someone when they can't defend themselves making money off of off, off IP that's not theirs. Then there's this product here. Now, I have nothing against the television productions. I don't. It's, it's, it's a great product when it came out, Television Rocks. But uh, they licensed from Activision the rights to the Magic in television games, which, as we know, Activision does not own the rights to. Again, Activision making money off something that isn't theirs. Man, <laughs> it just bothers me a little bit when that happens, you know. The Magic was a good company. It was. They produced some really great products, had some really good people working for them, really great box design. I mean, if you've seen the computer ones, even the computer ones, if you open this up here, it's got Magic embossed in the plastic there. This could fit cartridges and discs. Pretty elegant for a computer product. Which brings us to the end. And yeah, now we'll open it up for any questions, anything I'm covered or anything I didn't cover. If anybody's got any questions on anything. Do you have any information on uh, how they did the clean room to initially not get sued by Atari to start making the cartridges? Like Activision did, Activision did that. Now, it's interesting that Atari did not, never ever sued them for that. Because I think they failed at that point with Activision because okay. it didn't work with them. They didn't try it again. They went after them when uh, Intellivision Demon Attack came out because right. it looked exactly like Phoenix. Mm -hmm. They didn't go after them for that. I think at that time, the programs were being hired for their experience, not their knowledge. And the 2600 doesn't have an operating system. Mm -hmm. So I think you couldn't really sue them for that. But they did make Intellivision games. Mattel didn't touch them either. So, I mean, who knows what happened there. I imagine they probably did have a clean room, especially with the ColecoVision. They had to figure that one out too. 
And Clegor didn't go after them either. So. Yes, sir. Uh, has anybody ever spoken about the suspension of the company? Um, I think Bill Grubb talked about it a few years ago. Yeah. And Bruce Davis also talked about it. What I find interesting is Bruce Davis was the CEO of Magic during the shutdown. At the time that that started happening, Bruce Davis was the CEO of Activision. So maybe he knew that the products weren't protected. I don't know. But yeah, when a company's suspended, they can't do anything. And they've been in suspension ever since. And as uh, Bill Grubb said, Activision has never filed to buy the rights. And when I did the search, I would have found something. Because those things are, are legal actions. You would have found, there would have been a paper trail somewhere. There hasn't been anything. No one has, a, has, has, has filed to acquire the magic rights and properties or the company itself. And I don't know how much the cost is to revive them because you have to fill out a certificate. Of, I wanted to find out what the cost was, but you have to fill out a certificate of revivership and there's a fee with that. So <laughs> it's probably, I don't know, no company has tried to rescind, so it's got to be a pretty big amount. And it keeps racking up as the years goes on. Yes, sir. I know, I know, but there's nothing legal to back that up. People assume that because Activision put out those products and who would put out a product that they didn't own the rights to. But a magic is a unique situation. It's a really, because they're, they're a suspended company that can't do anything. They can't defend themselves. Could a magic legally sell the rights? I, no, they cannot. That's the other thing. You can't operate as a company. So I don't even know how they'd go about going after the rights of a suspended company. That'd be an interesting thing to figure out. Yes, sir. So if they're suspended and they can't really do anything except pay mounting fines that will pretty much grow to perpetuity, right. then they're basically dead. Uh, well, it's a guarantee. Pretty much. So officially, they can't terminate until those debts are settled. And they can't terminate. It's like it's catch-22. It's criminal, the company needs to terminate, but they can't terminate because they owe money. And the bankruptcy filing and the sale didn't cover that debt. So they're still there in limbo. We're in the back there. Um, I was always just fascinated by Imagic as a company. I thought they said I thought they created some really great products, some really great and funny advertising. A box design was was on par. Some really challenging games, and had some great people working for them. And it's just unfortunate that the crash happened the way it did. They couldn't do their stock offering the way they did, and it's just, it was just tragic because uh, they were a great software company, just as Activision was too. But Activision was the only company to survive the crash. Yep, they had a lot of inventory they couldn't move because they couldn't get space in the stores to sell them. Yeah. They were fighting for shelf space. They couldn't get into Kmart at all. Wow. And that was a tough thing like for them. A, do you think there's, like you said, the uh, ex-employees came in and bought a lot of stuff. Do you think that's where a lot of it ended up or is there maybe a huge cache of Imagic stuff? Oh, there could be. Although what's interesting is that Imagic was occupying Activision office space near the end, which I think is kind of ironic in a way. <laughs> and they probably had stockpiles of games and stuff in warehouses and who knows what happened to that stuff. So yes, sir. Peter Davis was the CEO at the end of... Uh, Bruce Davis, yes. Bruce Davis. And <laughs> how soon did he go to Activision? Right? I think it was a few years later. I, think, I don't think it was immediate. But I thought it was interesting that he worked for both companies and then this interesting thing happened. <laughs> another company in the 90s that primarily operated as interactive magic but they would sometimes shorten their name to iMagic I'm like they yeah probably magic. once again uh, the, the copyright holder would have been in magic and they can't defend they can't themselves defend they can't do anything and no one's working for the you can't have employees either when you're suspended so who knows there might be an end to the story at some point but who knows someone has to file the certificate of revivership and Yes, a magic could, could reemerge and start protecting their IP. <laughs> that I don't know. You have to ask a lawyer for that one. 
and I am not an attorney. I don't even play one on TV. Yes. Buy magic just to see Microsoft. It's true. Maybe we should all pull together and buy a magic. <laughs> Who's with me? It's just interesting that even with the retro community in all these years that a company hasn't tried to do that to me. It's just interesting. There's been some big companies lately that have been like Embracer and some of these others that have just been buying up loads of IPs from dead companies. It kind of surprised yeah. someone like, hey, we got, we got couch cushion money for that. Yeah, they might have looked at a magic and saw the price and went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Sticker shock. Yeah. Listen, I don't know what the amount is. You got to file that certificate to do it. And there's a fee to do that. Yeah. So. Um, it's, I didn't go any farther because you have to commit. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the information is free, but if you try to get actual details, yeah. Yeah, you have to, you have to, you have to sign it. You have to, you have to start doing the process. Which maybe one day I'll look into because I am curious of what the amount is to get out of uh, suspension. But they're in good standing in every other category except with the franchise tax board. Yes. Have you managed to get a hold of any of the old employees other than Bob Smith? Uh, a few. Uh, Dave Johnson, uh, Rick Ludwig Levine. Yes, sir. Oh, well, Dragonfire to me is, is one of my all-time favorites. I like that one. I'm pretty much any, pretty much any platform I'll play it on. Although on the Big 20, it's insanely difficult. <laughs> Big 20 version. Um, not sure, but any, any of the lesser ones. I mean, Crime and Punishment I like too. It's a, it, 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 it's a judge similar. You play the judge, and you're given the facts of the case, the background of the suspect, and the accused, and you and you make the decision, and then it shows you what the judge in the case actually decided compared to what you decided. You can see if you were harsher or more lenient than the actual judge was. It's kind of an interesting game. Yes? You know what I'm going to ask you about unreleased games. As far as I know, there is one unreleased in Magic game other than Wing War, and that's Beezer for the... Uh, Beezer for the Intellivision, yes. Yes, Gary yeah. Cato. Yep. Anything, uh, you know anything about it? No, it's an interesting thing is I have only seen one Magic prototype in my lifetime. It's like they're not as common as Atari prototypes are. And, um, and who knows what happened with Beezer. I focused this talk mostly on the release products, not the stuff that wasn't, because they had a lot of stuff in the bin that we don't even know the names of most of them that was going on. Beezer was a licensed arcade title that they were going to release for the Intellivision, but it never happened. And I think there were some screenshots, there were mock-up screenshots in a magazine yeah. at the time. But we've never seen a final uh, product. Wing War for the Intellivision also is another one that's out there. Uh, Moon Sweeper for Vic-20, I'm pretty sure, is out there. But we haven't found them yet. All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hope you find it informing. <laughs>